in the way America works is it's not Saudi Arabia. This is not Russia. The way America works is the president is not a sovereign. The governor is not a sovereign. The Constitution is above to hold the people accountable to the Constitution. That's why when Pastor Rodney Howard Brown was arrested, they had to release him. You see, a lot of people don't want trouble. And I'm not necessarily looking for trouble. I really don't want trouble. I don't really want court. I don't really want any of that either. But at the end of the day, what we're doing isn't wrong, isn't foolish, isn't dangerous, and isn't illegal. And don't let anyone try to guilt you or shame you or manipulate you into thinking, not yet, that what this is is that. Because it's not that. If you're okay to go to Walmart, you're okay to go to church. Straight up. And uh, so that's that, and I'm finished with that. I'm happy that you're here. I'm going to be here. To be honest, I was going to be here whether you're here or not here, but I'm glad I'd rather have you here. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Um, so there's, there's some things that, let me just explain to you, that God is doing. God is speaking. People are responding to God. Um, I've been seeing some good, good movement. And um, I'm not sure why it takes pressure for us to learn how to pray. I, I, don't, I don't know necessarily why sometimes that is the way it is, but many times that's what happens. Many times it's through a hardship, through a hard time, through, through that, you know, it's, it's the crushing that produces the oil. And so in spite of what is happening, God is moving. I just wanted to encourage you that. I know that you know that. I know that many of you have already shared testimonies and you, you see it and you recognize it, but, but I want to encourage you. So if you are here, if, um, yeah, we're ready to roll. So if you are, uh, if you are here, um, the live stream is going? Okay, cool. So we're live on YouTube. We'll be on Facebook. Welcome those who are watching, those who are here. So my, um, my intention today in preaching is, is that, that we would leave here convinced, more convinced, not, not about ourselves, not about a church, not about anything like that, more convinced concerning Jesus finishing the good work that he began in you. And I, I want to really communicate, so if you were watching last Sunday, Wednesday, this is going to make sense. It will stand alone, but it, it'll be better understood within the context of Sunday and Wednesday. And so if those of you who are watching, you can go back and see those. Um, but I want to start with Philippians 1, uh, 6, which I'm going to read. But before I go there, I want to, I want to be clear about my objective. Sometimes we're not clear about our objective. The, uh, one is to glorify Jesus, to edify his body. Two, to strengthen you and call you forward in the name of Jesus, for the fame of Jesus. To stop and ask ourselves, do we give Jesus the first and the last word in all things that concern us? I, I saw on um, Instagram the other day, uh, it was a, a pastor posted it and, it, and it had the word pastor, and it had all the voices that were talking to him. The ones that are saying, we got to get back to church. We can't come back to church. I'm not going to be there for a while. All the, like 10 different voices. And you know, what was really, really sad is that the one voice that matters wasn't there. The voice of God wasn't there. It was all these other voices that were speaking without the voice of God. And I don't, I don't know, and then I spoke to a lady pastor who I became friends with in Rwanda yesterday and she was saying that she was in a church and the name of the church is Miracle Center, some sort of like, they're calling it a Miracle Center, but they're afraid to meet. And so I'm not condemning anyone who's not meeting. My point is, whatever you're going to be, be that. And, and if you feel that it's unwise to meet, then I don't condemn anyone. There's no shame in that. That's fine. But whatever you're going to be, let there be continuity in that. If you're going to be a believer, believe. If, if you're going to be a Christian, live like Christ. Like if, and we all fall short of this, but whatever you're going to be, be that. And, and, and sometimes we've got to stop and ask ourselves, do we really allow God to speak to us? See, like for me, I have my own issues in life, but my issues have never been to try to please people. 
I'm on the opposite end of the spectrum. If I'm not careful, I can be arrogant and I cannot care what you think and I can tell you I don't care what you think and when I was, I don't care. So I have to humble myself, be more gentle, move more toward the center and try to hear yes from God first but also hear from people. But I have never been a, someone who makes a decision from the outside. Never. I've never been that way and I thank God that I wasn't raised that way and I thank God because that, that's, if you're going to lead, God has not called you to be a dictator, but you're going to lead. If you're going to lead, lead. If you're not going to lead, don't lead. <laughs> but, but if you're going to lead, lead. And so what broke my heart is that all of these outside forces are speaking to someone who's supposed to be led by God. And it was a meme. It wasn't a person. So I'm not talking about a person indirectly, just so you know. It was a meme, it, it, and it was showing the reality of what goes on in the life of a pastor and all these different voices that are talking, and it was no voice of God. God said, we're going to do this. And I thought about that, and I said, you know, it's true. Most people, they don't live in response to the Father. They live in reaction to what's put in front of them. And as the kingdom of God people, we cannot live in reaction to the world around us. We have to live in response to the Father who is within us, Christ within us, the Holy Spirit within us, the one who's leading us. I, I cannot react to the world if I'm going to be led by the Spirit. If I react to the world, I have nothing for the world. I'm just like the world. And we're not like the world. You are not, the, you are not like the world. My last initiative here today is to fully convince you that Jesus will finish the good work he began in you. For our fellowship is in the gospel. From the first day until now, our fellowship, let me explain this, is not based on friendship. It's not based on feelings. It's not based on common likes. It's not based on a common past. Our fellowship is in the gospel. It's Christ-centered, Christ-oriented. He's the foundation. We're going to follow him. We're going to put him first. Without that, we do not have fellowship. The, 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 the rich interaction of life that flows from a believer to a believer, the rich, deep love and honesty, the genuine care and, and concern, the, the rich generosity and hospitality, the tenderness and the care, the willingness to serve, those things that flow within the context of fellowship, that is Christ-centered. That is not in and of us. That doesn't proceed from me. Me, I don't want to serve you. And to be honest with you, you don't want to serve me. But in Christ, in Christ, it's different. When he's the fellowship, the deacon, let me tell you a story about the deacon. The deacon yesterday, who doesn't really give me much grief, the deacon sends me a text yesterday about air condition prices. And so I'm looking at this text going, this is interesting, but he really did me a solid the other day and cut my hair. So I'm going to look this up for him. So I start looking this stuff up. I'm telling this is now real talk here. And, I'm, and I start looking up his air conditioned prices. And my air conditioner that would not go on, would not go on. He was there. We spoke in tongues over the thing. We, I mean, he almost punched the thing. All of a sudden, boom, the thing kicks on. And the way I interpreted the air conditioner not working is the devil is trying to attack my sneaker situation. So I'm thinking this is not good. But the Lord, watch what the Lord did. The Lord gave me an opportunity. To serve. <laughs> and in doing that, all of a sudden, the air conditioner kicks on. And now it's working, the button, the clicker, and, and the whole thing is like, I even clean the thing. <laughs> See? But there is an opportunity, watch this, that comes from serving others. There's a breakthrough that comes when you serve others. Now, do we always feel like serving others? I don't. I mean, I don't know about you. Come on. I, I, our fellowship is in the gospel, the good news. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it 
unto the day of Jesus Christ. The word confident is such a rich and loaded word. I'm going to share more with you about that word. But one of the words is convinced, convinced to be fully persuaded, it, it, to trust. It's a very rich word. And so God wants us to be competent, not in our ability, not in our preparation, not in our education, not in our bank account, competent that he who began a good work in you will finish it because he's like that. He is the author and he is the finisher. He is the one who initiates and follows through. He's the one who makes a promise and has the power to fulfill what he said. Some of us with good intentions, we say things. I've done it. You've all done it. We say things with good intentions, but sometimes we lack the power or the discipline to follow through on good intentions. He does not lack the power to follow through, to be faithful, to do what he said he was going to do. Amen. Come on. Now, here's the thing. If we believe that as a, as a, as a people, okay? If we believe that God is going to finish what he started, you know what that does? That breaks off the insecurity. That breaks off the touchiness. You know that insecure people are touchy? Sure. You know when you're dealing with an insecure, broken person, when you have to think a lot before you say something to them because you might offend them. That's true. Come on. I do not let people like that in. I love you. I hug you. I, I wash your feet. But I cannot have a constant flow if you're touchy. Because if someone is touchy, they need healing. Yes, we'll be there to help them get healed. But if you're having a relationship like that with everyone is always touchy, you can't do anything and go anywhere like that. Someone who's touchy and insecure, they don't have your back. They can't because they're broken. Someone who's broken can't have your back. That's why they have to get healing. But this is the thing. If we're confident that God is going to finish what he started, we're not going to get weary. We're going to continue and press through. Do we get weary? We do get weary. Do I get weary? Yes, I get weary. Do you know how many times? I think for every time I wanted to quit the ministry, I think I wanted to quit the church five times for every one time I even considered wanting to quit the ministry. I know that none of you ever think about quitting. I'm just being honest, but if we're confident, you know what confidence does? The more confidence you have in him, the more the quit is removed. See, if I look at a situation and I don't genuinely believe that God is going to finish it, he's going to follow through on it, he's going to bring that thing to full maturity, it becomes easier to abandon something that I feel God is going to abandon. But you know what, when if, now I don't want to say this to you, now don't get mad at me, but if you were abandoned, if your mom walked out, or if your mom died, or your dad died, or your dad left you, or if you were abandoned, and that abandonment hasn't been healed, you know what happens? You see through abandonment. If you were abused, you know what you see through? Whether you know it or not, you have authority issue because you were abused. And until that abuse gets healed, you will not respond to authority correctly. And the enemy did that to you on purpose so that you wouldn't be aligned, so that the, the power and the faith wouldn't flow. Amen. Come on. That's true. The enemy does, he, he doesn't plant, it's not just the initial seed that he plants, he wants a harvest. So God wants us to be confident that Jesus will finish what he began. Now, look, come with me to Hebrews 12, verse 1. Therefore, I'm going to do a quick run through. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside... Every weight in sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your soul. So God is telling us here that there is a person I must focus on and there is something about who he is that I need to, to, to focus on and remember and there's also something that I need to focus on and think about and consider which is to deeply ponder. There's something that I need to consider and it's this, that he suffered innocently and he went through a great amount of hostility 
even though he was innocent. If I don't know that and think about that, I will get weary because what will happen is I'll be doing the right thing. It won't get the right results and, and a lack of results will wear me down. But if I know that, wait a second, this is what Socrates said. He said, if there would ever be an innocent man, they would scourge him and nail him to a tree. The Greek philosopher. That was a prophetic. And so that's what happened to the innocent one, to the just one, to the only one that is holy. They nailed him, they whipped him, stripped him, and nailed him to a tree. What happens? We're doing the right thing. We're trying to move forward and we get resistance. The least bit of resistance, we go, this must not be God. <laughs> you better put your chin strap in and your mouthpiece and you better get your head and your shoulder down and realize that if you're going to go anywhere, you're going to have to start running through walls. Because there's going to be obstructions and there's going to be things that try to ensnare you. And the things that try to ensnare you, you're going to have to kind of just throw them off. And the other things, you're just going to have to plow through those things. So now, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. So let, let, me, let me just dive in and then I'm going to come back. The author and finisher means the chief leader, the author, the captain, the completer, and the consummator, the one who brings everything to, to full. He's going to begin he, he, and he's going to finish. And, and this, is, this is a really, really critical thing because this is, in essence, who he is. So here's the, the issue. The danger of unbelief is what spirit, my spiritual father, Steve Stewart, says. The danger of unbelief is I begin to question the integrity of God. Now, if I'm sitting here, watch this. If I'm sitting here and I'm talking to you, let's say I'll use my dad. He's a good example. And I start telling him that he's a liar and he's lying to me and he's not going to do what he said. How many of you know he's not going to appreciate that? He's going to be like, buddy, what are you, sick? What, are you kidding me? I'm not going to lie to you. Blah, blah, blah. And he's going, to, he's going to tell me it's offensive. One of the things that we don't realize is that it's offensive to God when I don't believe him. Because it's personal and it's questioning his integrity. Okay. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher for our faith. Your faith doesn't come from you. It doesn't come from me. I don't have faith. If I, if I had faith, I'd sell it on eBay. I don't have faith. Jesus speaks and faith comes. Faith comes how? By what? Hearing. So if I'm not listening, what's happening? Other things are talking. The news, the media, your scared family. And so what happens, that stuff gets in you, in you, in you, in you, and then you respond in unbelief and fear instead of staying in the Word, listening to the Holy Spirit, listening to the voice of God. Because no matter what anyone says, what you listen to consistently is what leads you. All right, this is good. By the way, I don't, I don't know if you realize this. This is a good news message because Jesus is going to finish what he began in us. Our job is to stick it out. But, but, I cannot bring to completion what he's doing. But I can do my part. I can stick it out. If I don't stick it out, he's not the one who abandoned. He's not the one that left. He's not the one that walked out. He's not the one that tapped out. He's not the one that gave up. So let's stay focused on him. Come with me to Revelation 1. This is not even my message, don't worry. Revelation, we're going to get into my message. <laughs> this is just a rehearsal here, dress rehearsal. And in Revelation 1, you know that John is on the island of Patmos, and, and my wife and I were in the cave uh, where he was um, last year. I was there in the very cave in the place. It was really, really interesting place. It, was, it had that hallowed feeling that God had been there. You know, and, and it was just like, wow, this is where he wrote the book of Revelation. So it was really interesting, our whole 
trip uh, to Greece was built around going there. That was the one place on earth that I wanted to go more than anywhere else. And I went there. So um, let's start in verse 4. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who was and is and is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. Watch this. The firstborn, protos is the word. We would get the word prototype from this word protos in Greek. The firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, and to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Here it comes. Now he's going to say something about himself. It's always fascinating the things that people say about themselves. Listen, when people talk about themselves, it always fascinates me. Watch, Jesus is going to reveal something to us about himself. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. <laughs> okay, you want to do that for me? The Almighty. So the word Alpha, it's, it's the first letter, but it comes from a Hebrew origin of Aleph, which is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. There's always some sort of situation. <laughs> That's all right. Aleph, it means strong, leader, and powerful. So the beauty of Hebrew is that one letter, one letter, not a word, one letter paints a profound picture. So now, if you go and you see a Hebrew word and you take just the letters and you allow the letters to paint a picture, see, with the Hebrew and with the Greek, they are, they are in a sense, pictorial languages where words are not just flat. A lot of our words are flat. I love my sneakers, I love pizza, I love... But in Greek, there's four different words. And so in English, many times, for those of you who that's your only language, if you're American, English is like a flat language. Well, Hebrew and Greek is, is a little bit different. So he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. The Omega is the last word. Thank you. Without you, I'll be in trouble. That's not the right one, sweetheart. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. Omega is the last letter in the Greek alphabet, which is finality, which is final. So he's saying that I am the strong, powerful leader who brings things to their final ending. And he says, you're going to see over the course of Revelation, thank you, over the course of Revelation 1 and 2, you're going to hear him repeatedly say something that I believe genuinely he wants us to hear right now. And here's why. I don't know if you know this or not, but we, not you, we are in the midst of a trial. Here's the thing. Some people have been faithful. Some people have been unfaithful. Some people have turned the ball over on downs. Some people have fumbled. Some people have thrown interceptions. None of us are perfect. But now, you, the game isn't over. The game isn't over. We are still, right now, in the midst of a trial. What does God want to say? Not me. What does God want to say to people, which is us, who are in the midst of a trial? But I, wa I want you to hear, because I, I don't want to speak to you. I I'm going to tell you something. The older I get, the more disinterested I am in my opinion. I was having a talk with my pastor, which we recorded. It's going to go public soon. And I, and I was talking to him, and I said, you know, what happens in life and in the ministry is you go through things that really hurt. And the more you go through things like that, the more you know deeply... 
that his way is the way. So when you're young and, and stupid, you like buck up against things and you want to do things your own way. That's why God would yoke a young oxen with an old oxen so that the older oxen would determine the pace. That's why he said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Why? Because the older oxen is not stupid, and that guy has been out in the sun for a long time, and he knows it's hot, but the young oxen wants to run and hurt himself, and the young oxen looks over at the older oxen in oxen language and says, young buck, I've been in the sun for a while. This is a hot and a long and a 12-hour day, so we're just going to pace ourselves because this is a long haul. And so when you're young in ministry and certain things in life, and even when you're immature spiritually, you could be old but still immature, you really are not convinced that his way is the way. And, and you can hear that in prayers because often in prayers, we are trying somehow to get God to do what we want instead of listening to what it is that he wants. And, and when your pain threshold has reached a place where you have learned genuinely that doesn't work i god doesn't need a good idea from adam god doesn't need a slick marketing scheme god doesn't need better instagram god needs he doesn't need anything but god wants people who are listening to him so that we can move forward with what he's saying god has no interest in what i want in terms of my will, my kingdom. God is looking for people who are yielded to him, who can hear from him. And as you grow, you know, wow, that was a better idea than mine. <laughs> so anyway, I am the Alpha. Let's continue. John, verse 9. Both your brother and companion, the tribulation, the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on the island that is called Patmos. For the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. Now you're going to hear that in the beginning, the voice of God sounds like a trumpet. As we continue the text, the voice of God sounds like the voice of many waters. And so what's happening is the tone of God's voice is determining what God is trying to get through to this man. He has to blow the trumpet to get his attention. God will get our attention and God is trying to get our attention and the voice of God when he's trying to get your attention is going to sound like a trumpet. And so he sounds and he hears this voice, boom, and, and, and now God is speaking to him and later Jesus reveals himself and then it says, and I heard his voice and it was as the sound of many waters. Why? Because he's getting ready to wash his church. You know how he washes his church? By speaking to his church. You know how the church stays dirty? We don't listen. We don't listen. I remember I was years ago, a long time ago, I was doing something sinful or saying something stupid and the Lord gave me this revelation powerful and I said, why would you give me this revelation now? I'm not really behaving. And he said to me, the word that I have spoken to you has made you clean. See, what God was saying is he was trying to turn my attention toward him because if I could turn my attention toward him, I will turn my mouth and actions toward him. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. What you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. And then he names the seven cities. Then I turn, verse 12, to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw... Let me say one thing to you. When God speaks, there needs to be a turning. A turning speaks of repentance. It speaks of attention. Moses saw the burning bush. He said that he turned to see... A turning is necessary. So this is how it works. You hear the sound, you turn. You don't just hear the sound and just do what you want to do. You hear the sound and you turn. When I talk to my children, I go, I am talking to you. Look at me. I'm, they're talking. They're over here. They're talking to me. They're not looking at me. I said, look at me. I'm talking to you. My grandfather would have screamed at me. Look at me when I talk. I don't want to raise little zombies that are in their own world, monsters. I don't want that. I know what it is to be a little monster. I don't want to raise that. <laughs> so, so now, we, there has to be a turning to see. This is very, very important. This is, okay. 
And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band, and his head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like flames of fire, and his feet were like fine brass, as refined in a furnace, and his voice was as the sound of many waters. So if we don't turn from the trumpet, we don't experience the washing of the many waters. This is, this is important. Jesus washes us by revealing himself to us and speaking to me. This message is not psychobabble. It's not introspective. None of us are going to look deep into our life and be happy. But I'm going to tell you what we need to do. We need to look deep and long at the face of Jesus so that we can begin to become like what we're beholding. Because whatever you behold, you'll reflect. If you behold strength, you'll be strong. If you listen to fear, you'll be fearful. Whatever it is that we, be we behold, we reflect. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was like the sun shining in his strength, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. The first thing he says, do not be afraid. We've been going over this again and again and again. Do not be afraid. This is his best friend. This is the one who knows him. This is the one who saw him crucified. This is the one who was the first one at his tomb. This is, his, this is the first one who recognized him in the boat. This is the one who put his head on his chest. But he wasn't so familiar with him that he lost the fear of the Lord. Sometimes we get so familiar. No, no, no. We don't want to get familiar. I want to stay hungry. Anytime you get too familiar with someone or something, you rob yourself of that thing. Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. You're going to hear something that Jesus says. He, he always says, I am he who lives and was dead and I'm alive forevermore. If you go back, it says, he who is was, is to come. So anytime God is saying something to you, he's speaking to you in the present and, and at the present, but it has implications concerning the past, specifically per, for perspective, and the future for direction. The word of God is three-dimensional. When God says something to you, it's usually multi-dimensional and multifaceted. But Jesus is always in now. Jesus isn't in yesterday. Jesus isn't in tomorrow, although he is in yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and forever. He, he's outside of time. He's transcendent of it, but he's always dealing with now. He always starts now. He always starts where I am, not where he wants me to be. Not where I want me to be, where I am, which is now. Who was, is, is, was, is to come. He always starts with is. I am he who lives and was dead. Lives, was dead, and I'm alive forevermore. So was, is, is, this is important. This is an important truth. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and death. Write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which are the seven churches. So Jesus, like the same way he does with parables, he gives him the interpretation. You don't have to pray about it. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to read about it. Here's what it is. <laughs> so he tells him what it is. The mystery now has just been revealed. Now, he writes to Ephesus, and I'm not going to spend time in Ephesus, but he tells them, you, you have discernment. You know false apostles. You guys are like, you guys experience revival, but you, there's a, I have something against you. You have lost your first love. 
And, and he, he continues. Now, that was the church. That was the biggest church. That was the mega church. That was the cool church. That was the church that everyone wanted to go to. And he said, I have this against you, that you lost your first love. What matters to God most is that he's first. So you have discernment, you have wisdom, you haven't quit, but you have lost the tenderness. Lord, restore to us the tenderness and the responsiveness of first love. Yesterday I was asking God to remove lukewarmness from my life. Remove it. All of it. I want it out. Whatever is not distinct, I want, I, we need as believers, we need to be distinct, red hot and burning. Not saltless, saltless salt. <laughs> no flavored salt. Not, not, not a bushel under the bed hiding from a virus. I'm sorry. Come on. Not hiding, not afraid, distinct. Not lukewarm. God said, I'll spit lukewarm out. Come on. Imagine how offensive that is. Imagine I, you come to my house, I pour you a coffee, and you go, Pfft, and you spit it out. That's really foul. The Lord will spit that out. He doesn't want that. It's not refreshing. It's not cold and refreshing. It's not warm and soothing. It has no distinctness to it. Come on. That's right. And, and, and so this happens to us. If you drink coffee, you know that when the coffee reaches a certain temperature, you have two options. Pour it out or throw ice cubes in it. Because it, if it's not, there has to be a distinct or it's... Now... The, what I want to focus on is what I believe God wants me to focus on. And, and that is to the church in Smyrna. Now, the church in Smyrna, the, the Turks call that city an infidel because Christianity has never really been uprooted from there. In Ephesus, he says, if you don't repent, I will remove the lampstand. Jesus does not want a halfway testimony. Jesus would rather not be represented than be misrepresented. Come on. That's right. Now, modern day Turkey is like 99.2% Muslim. And Smyrna is the city that they call the infidel city. Right. That's the, that's the <laughs> now, out of all the churches, there's only two churches that didn't get rebuked. Guess who's one of them? Smyrna and Philadelphia. Doctor, you've been around for a long time. So now, watch what he's saying to Smyrna. Now, you're going to see that. I don't want to, don't get mad at me now. But you're going to see that the greatest opposition often to what God is doing is the last move of God. So sometimes the greatest threat to the church is not Governor Murphy or, or Bill Gates or the New World Order or whatever you're into whatever conspiracy you're on this week, 5G, 10G, whatever it is, whatever it is, that is not the greatest threat to the church. The greatest threat to the church is our own compromise and lukewarmness. Okay, so I promise this is going to be an encouraging message. I'm not, I'm not at all done. Now, first and the last is, I wish Brett was here. Brett, I, I, I had to ask you a question in public, but you're not here. So, there's a word in protos, which is like where we would get the word prototype. I'll ask the question. If anyone knows the answer, somehow I'll, be, I'll bless you. But there is a word here, a fascinating word, in the definition of protos, and it's the word superlative. Superlative. Does anyone know where the word superlative is consistently found? Anyone? Okay, that's too spiritual. <laughs> the word superlative is consistently found on a Rolex watch. Superlative. Chronometer. Superlative. It's a word. It's a distinct word. It's like... Consistently, consistently better. <laughs> High above. If you don't look at that, you can't know about it. So now, 
Foremost, superlative, foremost, this is another word for first. When Jesus says, I am the first, he means foremost in time, place, order, rank, and importance. The word final means the end. So Jesus is telling, now, I don't know if you realize this, but usually whatever we repeat a lot, we actually really care about, right? If someone has a reoccurring theme in their life, if there's a pain that they're always talking about or a desire that they're always talking about, it's because deep inside it matters. So the scripture is saying something about Jesus consistently, but it's saying the same thing with different words, and there's something that God wants us to see and understand in this season, okay? Jesus, author and finisher, Alpha Omega, first and last, beginning and ending. I don't know if you see the commonality, the thread there. There's a thread. God, there's something God wants us to see within this. And to the angel of the church of Smyrna, right, these things says the first and the last. He who was dead and came to life, I know your works, tribulation and poverty. But you are rich. <laughs> yep. You know what he says to Laodicea? You think you have no needs. You think you're rich and you're increased with goods. You're poor, blind, naked, miserable, and wretched. Jesus will, he will offend the whole front row and the whole second row and the deacons and the elder board and everyone and me and you and anyone. But he'll give us the correct perspective so that we can realize, wait a second, something needs to be changed. He doesn't say that so you stay or we stay poor, blind, naked, miserable, and wretched. And I'm not saying that you are. You have to know that. Some people are not willing to even think about that. They want to think about other people and other issues because it's easier for me to see your speck with my log. So now... He says, I know your works, tribulation, and poverty, but you are rich. He says, so here's the facts, but there's something more powerful and more everlasting than the facts. It's called the truth, and the truth is you're rich to the church under pressure. They have lost their goods because of the name of Jesus. Watch. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews but are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. So the Jews in the city were stirring up strife against the Christians. And by the way, this is a Jew, Jewish, Jesus is fully Jewish and fully, fully God and fully bad. This is a Jewish, this is not anti-Semitic. This is a Jew talking to a Jew <laughs> about a Jewish situation concerning a Christian church. He says that they are the synagogue of Satan. Because they are stirring up strife and persecution against the church. And the reason that they did that is because the Jewish people in those days, they had what we would think of today as like a not-for-profit status. And the Christians were a threat to them losing their not-for-profit status. I, I, I'm consolidating a big story and making it, it's simplifying it in a way where the, 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 Hebrew, the Jewish people said to the Rome, we are not going to worship your gods, but we'll pray for you. So Rome said, okay, fine, and they made like a little deal on the side and kind of like, don't bother us, we'll kind of leave you and, and you just do what you do. And they say, well, we won't pray to you or to your gods, but we'll pray for you. And, and they translated what God said to Jeremiah, pray for the peace of Babylon, which we always have conferences about the peace of Jerusalem. But no one ever says, let's pray for the peace of Babylon. But that was what Jeremiah said to the people of God because the prophetic voice does not tell people what they want to hear, but what they need to hear because... The prophetic voice is telling people what God is saying, not what people are feeling, what people want to hear, what needs to be said. Okay? So now, I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. Isn't that interesting how your situation cannot be how God sees you? Wow, come on. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews but are not or of the synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw you into prison that you may be tested 
and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you a crown of life. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Now, let me say something to you. You know, you know the big problem? You know, you, know, you know really the issue? The issue is really, I wish it was on the screen, because it's on my screen, it's not on your screen. So I'm dealing with some disappointment publicly. Christianity, my slide here is, is Christianity versus Jesus. Christians versus Jesus. That, that's, who's playing today on Sunday? Who, who's like, what? Christians versus Jesus. Here's what Christians say. The devil can't touch me because of the blood of Jesus. If you've been in church, dear Jesus, you've heard this a million times. I remember one time my pastor said something that made me laugh. The blood of Jesus doesn't protect you from the devil. It protects you from the wrath of God. <laughs> anyway, that's just the Bible. So we'll just not worry about that for now. But here now you have Christians. The devil can't touch me because of the blood. Here's red letters. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. It's eminent. <laughs> this is not like pray it doesn't happen. He's telling you it is going to happen. It's coming. Do not fear any of those things that you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil, the devil can't touch me. I can imagine the church today, American Spiritual Warfare Conference. Jesus sitting in the front row. And, and, and they go, the devil cannot touch me. And I can just sit there and just imagine Jesus going, interesting. I wish I would have known that in Revelation 2. We have to adjust. You know what our, you know what our problem is? We have a theology devoid of suffering. You cannot teach kingdom of God without suffering. Pa uh, you, I, you can't. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. The devil indeed is about to throw you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. The crown of life are for those who are faithful unto death. That's what it's for. If you're not faithful, no crown. This is not a participation trophy. This is, if you're faithful, you get a reward. And the, the profound thing about this reward, it's actually to cast at the feet of Jesus anyway. So it's actually the test that makes you trustworthy. He says, be faithful, be trustworthy, even unto death. In the test, be trustworthy. Listen, if we fumbled, if we had a turnover on downs, repent, be faithful. You're in a test. Believe it or not, the world around you is looking at you. You're in a test. Your family is looking to you. You're in a test. You're not being martyred. It's not really that serious. You have food in your refrigerator and, and Wi-Fi and, and uh, all the other comforts, and, and you're actually okay. You're pretty okay. I don't, I don't want to say that to you, but I'm going to try to be nice. But you're all right. <laughs> you're going to be okay. No. So now, this is the preseason. So now, what's happening is, he's telling them, some of you, not all of you, some of you are going to die. Some of you are going to be martyred. Don't worry, there's a crown of life. Every time God says something, there's always an alternate perspective that he's offering to his people. You're poor, I say you're rich. They think they're going to kill you, you're going to get a crown of life. They're so God will look at this situation totally differently than the way it's being reported. Yeah. You have the fake news or the good news. Here's what happened with the good news. If you reject the good news, it becomes bad news. If you embrace the good news, it does its work in you and on you and through you. And you will have joy to endure. Jesus... It's telling them not to be afraid because he's going to be with them in the suffering. It's not like the suffering means he's abandoned you. That's what we think. That's, that's what we think. What is this happening to me? What? 
let me share a vision I had with you. I don't even know why I'm doing this, but I'm going to do it. Helen is bringing this out of me. So I was in a church, and I had a vision. They were preaching, and it wasn't about the church there or what they were saying. It was about our time now. And I was in a church, and I had a vision of the ancients sitting in the room with us, like the great cloud of witnesses. They were sitting in the unoccupied chairs, like sitting there. The ancient bishops, the early church fathers with the beards, the reformers, the revivalists. There was people who had went before us who were faithful. And when they were listening to the preaching, they all had their heads down. They couldn't believe what was coming from the pulpit. Couldn't believe it. Listen, this is not psychotherapy. This is behold the face of God until you are changed. <laughs> this is not get more introspective and work on yourself. You can't. This is repent of your sins, confess, and be transformed. Turn, yeah. This is not three ways to feel better about yourself. There's nothing wrong with therapy. Some people need it, to be honest. But the reality of what I'm talking about is something deeper and more transcendent. So anytime Jesus is telling the church to either repent or to be faithful, there's something that he reveals about himself. Every single time he starts speaking to the church, he first reveals something concerning himself. And to the church that is, in, that is under a trial, to the church that is under pressure. Now, now, the trial in different generations and in different places is different. But, but there is a pressure. Whether you know it or not, there is pressure on us. They want you to take their vaccine. They want you to live in fear. They don't want us to meet. They want you to stay at home. They want to let Walmart open. They want to close down small businesses. It's safe to go to Walmart, but not Ace Hardware Store. You, I mean, somehow the Wuhan skips over the boardwalk and lands on the beach. So there's all these things. There's all the, and, and the Wuhan now, it gets more vicious at night. So there's a curfew. Stay home. And you wear a mask, but they're not. You wear your mask. I'm not against your mask. God bless you. I've never sat here and looked at masked people. I mean, there's always a new thing. It's fine. However you feel, you're welcome with a mask, without a mask. But what they're trying to do is they're trying through fear to control us because if we move in fear, it's impossible to be faithful. I cannot be... Why does it, the first thing he says... Do not fear. When, when he sees John, his best friend, do not fear, do not be afraid. And then he touches him. There's a, there's a calming thing that happens with a touch of God. Some of us need a touch of God. I need a touch of God in my life. Some of you need a fresh touch of God. It's, it's good that you have the courage to admit it. Do not fear any of those things. So, so you have the synagogue of Satan, which is unbelieving Jews trying to stir up strife against Christians. And, and this is the thing. It's always the last move of God that wants to shut down the present move of God. They were the last move of God. They were the place that God was once meeting with. The people that God was speaking to, God fulfilled everything he said to them in Jesus. They didn't want to change. You don't want to change, you get left behind. It's either you get lit or you get left. You either get red hot, and you know what happens when someone's red hot? You know what happens when someone's red hot? They respond. Yesterday, I, I, my wife and I, I sent her a link for sneakers. I said, if you want these, you got to get them now. They're going to be gone. Two minutes later, she opens her phone, gone. When something's hot, it's hot. When it's hot, it's moving. When it's hot, you got to respond. I don't think she cared that much, to tell you the truth. But the reality is, if you're not responsive to what God is doing, God will leave you. Not leave you like forsake you. God will keep moving. So you either move with him. 
So what's the issue with the synagogue? It became a synagogue of Satan when it no longer embraced the new thing that God was doing. Behold, I do a new thing and it'll come up speedily. His name is Jesus. The promises were made to the patriarchs. This was for them. It wasn't like God didn't intend. It wasn't like God wants to exclude them. No, it was for them. But if there's no response, then we don't, we don't receive what God has. And he's paid for it. And he, 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 like, he paid for it in his blood. Like He wants us to have it. He's committed to finishing the work that he began in us. God is not going to give up on me because I'm slow to get it. We just go around the mountain. We'll go through the test 427 times until you pass it. <laughs> Maybe some of you have taken, everyone who has taken a test 427 times laughs. So, so for the rest of you who pass on the third time, then, you know, God bless you. For the rest of us. So the point of, of, of what, I'm, what I believe the Spirit of God is trying to say to us is that we have to align our perspective with God's. Now, when you're praying and you're using your authority as a believer, you don't have to say the blood of Jesus. The devil knows about the blood of Jesus. What you need to use is the authority in the name of Jesus. Come on. The devil shows up to Jesus. Jesus is like, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. The devil says, it is written. He didn't have to use Jesus' name because it was Jesus speaking. <laughs> so, but he spoke the word of God. That's why, you know what you see in, in the book of Acts? You see the progression of Peter's life and ministry where he uses Jesus' name in the name of Jesus Christ, stand up and walk. And then he says, stand up and walk. And he doesn't use Jesus' name because it's Jesus speaking through him. That's right. and, and, and whatever Jesus speaks to, <laughs> yes it's got to move it's got to move it's got to move do not fear any of those things listen I want to say do not fear now do not fear now do not fear what is coming do not feel the uncertainty of this moment you know what the truth is the truth is, is the word truth you know what it means certainty Certainty. It's one of the English translations of the Greek word for truth. Certainty. Why would God speak certainty to us? Because we're going to be in uncertain times. Why would give you, God give us a comforter? Because we're going to be in uncomfortable situations. Why would give us a helper? Because you need a helper. Why would God give us a counselor? Because I need a counselor. Why would he... God has made himself fully available to us. He is going to finish the work he began in you. When, when, so it's like, as you hear this, like, so what do you want me to do? Nothing. <laughs> nothing. What do you, nothing. This is not about anything. This is about you being convinced concerning Jesus, him being the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, the first and the last, the author and finisher, him going to finish what he began in you. The Wuhan doesn't change that. The economy doesn't change that. The uncertainty of the moment that we're facing doesn't change that. The pain that we feel because of loss doesn't change that. The discouragement that we feel because things have slowed down doesn't change that. It transcends that. What I'm trying to say is something that is transcendent to where we are right now. Jesus says to them, I'm the first and I'm the last. I'm going to finish this thing. Be faithful. Be faithful. To the church who is under trial, he says, do not be afraid and be faithful. And he warns them that some of them are going to be killed. And he's saying that Satan is doing it and he ties it to the synagogue of Satan. Because right. it has to come from somewhere. <laughs> it's not just demons over here making problems. Demons are working through people. And, and let me say something to you short and, and, and sweet. But the reality is that the principalities try to merge with the municipalities. See? And what happens is it creates an ecosystem of destruction and bondage. I'll use a very simple and easy one to recognize. Abortion is not just the spirit of Baal. It's not just child sacrifice. It's the spirit of mammon. 
Mammon is what makes it harder to overcome than just Baal. You know that when Jesus spoke to the storm, you know what he was confronting? Baal. That's Baal. So what happens is, so many people have to profit through the abortion industry. It has created an ecosystem of, of, of murder and bloodshed. So it makes it harder to overcome what happened. They said it's legal, it's okay, it's your choice, it's your body, it's all right. Well, there's another heartbeat. It's not your body. It's in your body. That's right. That's right. Come on. Yep. So what happens? There's an ecosystem that is created when the municipalities come into agreement with the principalities. And it creates systemic oppression and murder, and it generates billions of dollars. Do you know what makes it harder to move on planet Earth? The billions of dollars. Why? Because people's hearts are anchored in money. Yeah, that's right. That's the truth. There's very few people that go, ah, can't wait to kill babies, ah. There's just some sick white people that probably do that, but there's very few people that do that. Most people go, oh, man, I can deliver a truck, and that brings, and then, and then there's waste, and then there's this, and then there's 800 a, a body, and, and, and so there's, there's all these things that fuel this thing. Like, like for example, uh, it's dangerous to go to church, um, but like the liquor store, you can just go and just drink as much as you want, no problem. Marijuana dispensaries in California. You can go ahead and smoke all the bud you want and drink all the beer that you want. But this is dangerous. Somehow, ooh, this is dangerous. Like, we're like a threat. They let criminals out and arrest pastors. See, I'm trying to say something, which you already know, most of you. Just so that we're aware. This is not about scaring you. Do you know, Jesus tells them, you're going to die. I mean, <clears throat> he's at least letting them know, like, some of you are, are going to really go through a hard time. Some of us may really go through a hard time in this life. The devil doesn't play fair. He doesn't play fair. He's not. People go, the devil's looking for legal access. He's a thief. What thief is looking for legal access? <clears throat> Should you shut every door on him? Yeah, but he's still a thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus wouldn't tell us that he steals, kills, and destroys if he didn't. Jesus would just say, plead the blood and you're good. <laughs> you know, I just get a shirt. I plead the blood and I just do whatever I want. I'm fine. No, it doesn't work like that. The blood redeems us. Yeah, it buys us back. It, it washes us. It cleans us. It makes us kings and priests. But it, kings have battles. Priests have a ministry. That's what you want to know what ministry is like. It's like a, a fight to serve. It's like a fight. It's like you fighting with someone because you want what's best for their life and they don't. And then you call people higher and they get offended. And then you hold people accountable to the commitment they made and they're upset. That's what it is. We're kings and we're priests. We have a ministry to God and service. And we have legislation to happen on the earth, which is never without conflict. You are in the midst of a trial. You are in the midst of a conflict. Be faithful. God is with you. Do not be afraid. No matter what you go through, be faithful. He's the first and the last, and he's going to complete what he began in you. I want you, I'm telling you, if you can hear anything that I'm saying, I'm not saying you're not reading enough. I'm not saying you're not praying enough. I'm not saying any of those things. The devil may be saying that, or God may be saying that. He <laughs> determined that. But what I'm saying is that God is going to finish what he began in us. There is no situation that's going to make him quit. God is not like Adam is too slow. I just need someone faster and, and easier to get along with. God is going to finish what he began in you. 
He's going to perfect that which concerns you. That means that there's things in you that he's going to bring to completion. There's things that he put in you that he's not going to give up on you. There's things that he's going to put in you and he's going to give you opportunities for those things that are in you to develop. There's going to be, you know how they develop? You know one of the ways they develop? Pressure. Pressure. You, you, you know something? I was sitting here and I was thinking about something. I was thinking, you know, you know, you know who, you know who, who's Mr. October? Come on. Reggie Jackson. You're dating yourself a little. Reggie Jackson is Mr. October. You should have known that one. Okay. You gave him a shot. <laughs> Mr. October. Do you know why he was called Mr. October? Because when it mattered... When the pressure was on, let, let me tell you about champions. You know when champions are made? The preseason and when the pressure's on. In the preparation. In the preparation. Prepare to be ready. All of you. Prepare to be ready. This week, prepare to be ready. Prepare to be ready to speak. Prepare to be ready to give a, a, why you have a hope in you. Prepare to be, uh, to explain to people why you're not afraid. Prepare to be ready to pray for someone, to love on someone, to encourage someone, to invite someone. Prepare to be ready. And I'll tell you why. The pressure is on. It's not just on us. It's not like the church. We're not, just so you know, I want to be honest, the church is not under persecution. We're being attacked as well, but our whole society, there are dark forces at work trying to collapse our society, and it could affect the church as well. But here's the thing about the church. The church and the kingdom advance no matter what. Amen. That's right. That's right. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. The church has outlasted every bloody dictator. Ten waves of Roman persecution and unarmed, uneducated people endured. Their children were fed to lions. The Christians said, we're going to feed your children to the lions, renounce your faith. They said, our children belong to Jesus. How's that for, for real faith? Not feelings, not when it's easy. Our children are blood bought, blood washed. But the blood doesn't mean there's no issue, there's no conflict. It just means that the second death doesn't offend them, affect them. Do not fear those who can kill the body. This is, and, and so now, again, the first and the last, he's going to finish what he started. And, and you could leave with a smile. If you could smile at me just for a moment. You could leave with a smile. I can see the smile through the mask by your eyes. God will finish what he started. God is not... God is not like, okay, you know, this guy doesn't get it. Done. Nope. He's patient. He's not like us. He's not like us. Thank God. The last thing we need is a God in our own image. <laughs> Real dangerous. <laughs> so, God is good. God loves you all the time. God loves you. God is not angry with you. God is looking to call you forward. Because following Jesus, if, if, Je if the kingdom is constantly moving forward of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. So it's increasing. It's going forward. It's unhindered. It's unshakable. It's not stoppable. That means that our posture in this life, and I've set my heart on this. I don't care if I'm crawling, I don't care if I'm rolling forward. I don't care if I'm falling forward. I don't care if I'm running forward, jogging forward, or walking forward. I am going to move forward in the name of Jesus. Me too. Amen. You, better, you better start talking to yourself and tell yourself, I will fear no evil. I'm going to move forward. And my forward is not your forward. But we can move forward together with confidence not in us, not in our own strength, that God will finish what he started. So to the church, 
to the people who are under pressure, God wants to say to you, be faithful. Be faithful. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that it is through your faithfulness that we can be faithful. It is because you loved us first that we can love you back. We don't do this in our own strength. You're the author and finisher of our faith. We're saved by grace through faith. It's you, but we're asking you to help us to respond correctly in this season. Forgive us for fumbling, for throwing interceptions, for a turnover on downs. Forgive us and help us to move forward together in faith, not in fear. Help us to be faithful in this trial in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So I love you. If you want to give to the ministry, you can write a check to We See Jesus, write rescue on the memo. If you want to give by card, you can see Sarah later. We love you. You're welcome here. I personally, I mean, if you have another.